Hello and welcome to the next episode of Let's Talk Brand, the first in Poland series of video interviews with world-class branding experts. Like before, I have not one but two guests. I decided to combine outstanding experts from abroad with Polish ones. Check out my previous conversations. You might already know that I will have a chat with Matt Davis from UK and Paweł Tkaczyk. I will talk with my guests about archetypes. Both experts have taught me so much about archetypes through their books and articles. I would like them to share this knowledge with you as well. If you want to listen to my previous solo conversations with this expert, just click the link. You can also read the bio, which is below. Hope you will enjoy this conversation. Hi, Matt. Hi, Pavel. Hey there. Hey. Okay, it's so wonderful to have you both uh, here. I Actually, I see a lot of similarities uh, between you, not only because of your beards or the way you work <laughs> or on stage. Hey, his beard is way better. <laughs> Paul's better looking than I. He's got more hair on the head. So. <laughs> we can discuss it later. Uh, yeah. But because the way you teach and the way you share uh, share knowledge, and uh, I would like to talk with you about archetypes. And I think I know a lot about it from your articles, from your books, like yours, Matt Storyatology, and yours, Pavel Narratology. I don't know if it was translated into English. Mm, it should. I think it is. Yeah. Really? Yeah. I don't know. All right. Okay. So, you, you okay. In fact, yeah. okay. Okay. <laughs> you Sorry, did, you didn't know. Yeah. You're not supposed to know. <laughs> <laughs> really? You're not why the not? target market. So, why, why should you? <laughs> I like to practice my English. So, it's the good yeah, way. Yeah, but you speak Polish. This is your superpower. So, yeah. You know. <laughs> All right. So, due to the fact that not everyone knows you yet, I guess. Um, I would like to ask you to briefly introduce yourself. So if you can start with you, Matt. Yeah, sure. Hi, everybody. Um, hi, Paul. Hi, Lucas. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm really excited for this conversation. So my name is Matt Davies. I, um, I, what, what can I say about myself? Ultimately, I help leadership teams rally around the big ideas of the future. So that's kind of, uh, that's the, the fluffy bit. What does that mean in reality? Well, I use the thinking of, of brand building to help businesses think about their long-term strategy. And usually growth is part of that, commercial growth is part of that, but that that, that comes because we fulfill the strategy. The, the, the strategy isn't making money, right? So it's having something bigger, a bigger narrative, a much more exciting, compelling, uh, customer-centric narrative, which then fuels the business and really kind of helps it take off and build build a positive brands. So that's what I do. Uh, I work with leadership teams all over the world. Um, and uh, as, as you've said, I, I, I sort of teach and share uh, my knowledge and, and what I pick up along the way. And so I'm excited to do that for you all today. Okay, wonderful. Thank you. Pavel, Paul? Uh, yeah, my fluffy bit is I'm Paul and I make my living by telling stories. <laughs> So oh, uh, yeah, this, <laughs> this this is what I do. Uh, sometimes I tell them in front of the audience. So, so I speak, I'm, I'm a public speaker. Uh, sometimes I write, I wrote three books, uh, but most of the time I help, help my customers tell their stories because I'm a brand strategist. Uh, and I strongly believe that a good brand, great brand is a story well told. So, so there are many people who have great products, who have uh, great services, who themselves are great brands, but they don't conquer the market the way they're, they're supposed to because they don't know how to tell it in an orderly manner. So, so this is what I help them with. All right. Okay. Thank you. So, uh, I think we will start with the basics and with the very simple questions. Um, what are the archetypes? And Matt, if we can start with you. Well, actually, I wondered um, if I could just start a little bit even before then, if that's okay. So I, I love to sure. uh, start with some definitions, and I, and Paul, I'd be interested to know what your thoughts are. But, but if I was to define a brand, I define brand as the meaning that your your audience attaches to you, right? So it's the meaning uh, that somebody derives about a company, a service, or a product, um, and that lives in their heads and their hearts, right? It doesn't. It's it's not just about um, a veneer and a logo and a series of fonts. It's something much more powerful than that. Um, so that's the first thing. And, and we, Paul and I are in the, in the game of branding, which is 
the management of that meaning. And so if I was to sort of ask, well, how do we as human beings um, manage meaning in our minds? The answer actually is stories. So, Paul, you mentioned this earlier, you know, you know, in terms of managing stories, telling stories. We see ourselves as a character, if you like, in a bigger, bigger narrative um, and brands are part of our story. So what I think is super important, if you if you sort of look at your your brand in that context, what you've got to do is you've got to identify who your audience is. Right. They're the hero of the story. And then you've got to figure out, well, how do we show up for that customer, for that for that audience? And that's where this wonderful subject of archetypes comes in. So just to answer the actual question I was I was set, archetypes are patterns of human behavior often amplified in stories. And so these are typical characters which show up in storytelling. And they're super powerful because we all instinctively recognize them. They are part of the way that, that, that we think. We could probably get into the psychology of it in a little moment or two. But ultimately, if you can latch onto and see your brand as an archetype in the customer's story, um, that allows you to communicate better, make better decisions, and, and align your team around what it is that they're there to do. So that's, that's I hope that kind of answers the question. But um, Paul, I don't know if you want to add anything extra to that. Uh, maybe not extra, but I love that, that we approach the same subject from a slightly different angles. Uh, because uh, for me, first of all, uh, yes, I, I totally agree uh, with what Matt said uh, about the brand. A brand is a set of associations, and it happens uh, within the head of the consumer. So, so uh, but this set of associations has a goal to fulfill, and this goal uh, is connected to the decision. So, so we use brands to influence the decisions of our consumers. We want them to, to pick our products, our services, ourselves. And uh, when you divide the decision in, into smaller bits, um, it, it contains uh, some, some elements. The first element is identification. Uh, and archetypes, they make identification easier because what Matt said, uh, there are some patterns uh, that, that you can associate. But the, the second, um, in, my, in my opinion, the most important part of, of the decision-making process is assigning a category to a brand. So uh, this is a market category. You go to Ikea to buy furniture, but you don't send your kids to, to learn languages there. Uh, so, so this is one thing. But this category is, uh, for, when you look at it from one side, uh, it has to be utilitarian. So, so uh, it has to serve some purpose. Uh, but from the other side, it has to just fit in your emotional context, uh, in, in the view of, of the world. So this, again, is where archetypes shine, because, because you can be uh, a certain utility to, to your customers, and th this is what you say straight up, uh, and you can be certain emotions to your customers, and this is where archetypes play a great role. All right, but we have 12 archetypes. Is, are 12 archetypes enough? Th there are no 12. I mean, I mean, this is one approach to okay. this. Uh, okay. Because Jung had 16, or, uh, this, this is uh, from the hero and the outlaw, you mm -hmm. are talking about the, the 12 archetypes. Mm -hmm. There are approaches where there are 20 archetypes, there are approaches where there are 16 archetypes, so, so, so you know, it depends on which way you approach it. Yeah, that should, that's probably a very, very good po point, Paul, and this is something that people don't really understand unless they're, they nerd out about mm -hmm. archetypes like you and I do, is that Carl Jung had the archetypes, I mean, he, he coined the phrase, um, and he floated the theory that basically um, there is this thing that we all have as human beings called the collective unconscious. And that this means that it, kind of part of our nature, part of the way that we instinctively look at the world, that we share similarities in the way that we respond and recognize things. So, for example, I seem to remember reading in one of his books, um, he goes through and he talks about like snakes, right? Snakes, we all instinctively fear them. You, you know, you could never have met a snake before in your life and you see it slithering across the room and you're terrified, right? And you try and get out the way. It's just like an inbuilt inside of human beings. So you could say that the snake is an archetype, right? It's kind of lives deep inside our psyche and we instinctively respond a particular way to it. Now, what happens subsequent to, 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 to Jung and his identification uh, and, and kind of discussions on archetypes is that people have got hold of the concept and worked with it. 
And so, Paul, you're absolutely right. I've actually got it here because I knew it would come up in conversation. The Hero and the Outlaw by Margaret Mark and Carol S. Pearson, I think was published around 2000. Um, and what they do is they, um, they basically take some of the archetypes that Jung uh, identified and they, they kind of do their own research. I've actually spoken and interviewed um, Carol S. Pearson myself personally. And what she said was, was that they looked at um, basically going through historically stories to find um, these characters that appear. Um, and so that one didn't make it unless they could verify that it um, that it was evolved uh, in stories from the most ancient of times. So we're talking ancient myths going back to Babylonian, Roman, Greek yeah, times. Because th this is the approach that they took. They, they uh, took the psychological uh, archetypes that, that Jung developed and, and they inserted it into stories. And th this is yeah. why they are more useful to us in everyday life. Uh, because uh, the psychology of archetypes uh, is in, in psychoanalysis and so on and so on. So, so uh, you would have to see a specialist about it. But, but uh, when you are talking about the brand, uh, when you are talking about the stories around us, uh, we can construct the stories. And the way they uh, construct the stories in, in the book, in, in The Hero and the Outlaw, uh, is slightly different from, from uh, what uh, psychologists think, think of archetypes. So, so uh, there are like three layers to each archetype. So, so there's the, the character, there's the role in the story, and there's what Matt said uh, about the, the underlying uh, concepts of, of the shared unconsciousness. What I think is interesting with the book though, and why it's very helpful for branders, is that what they did was they tried to map the archetypes to consumer motivations. So this is really interesting for us. So we're building brands. We're trying to make sure we show up correctly for our audience. We evoke the right emotion, like you were saying, Paul, in, in, in our customer. And so understanding what's motivating our customer can help us think about, well, how we show up. I always use the example, like for example, let's imagine um, I was trying to get um, a finance director right, for my business. Now, instinctively, I know that I wouldn't want somebody who was really jokey and having a laugh all the time and didn't take their responsibilities seriously, right? So I would be looking for someone who was knowledgeable, trustworthy, um, who was quite serious and diligent in their work, right? And really, you know, they, they really believed in that. And likewise, with a brand, let's say I was looking for a fine, a, a piece of software, to help me with my business finances. If I showed up a website of a potential supplier of that software and it was all cartoons and people joking and it just would feel weird. It wouldn't sort of sit right with me. But if it's if I, if I, if I showed up and it was teaching me knowledge and it was very kind of calming and serious and I could tell that they, they had a lot of wisdom and they were talking about all the things that I, I cared about and they showed maybe graphs and stats and stuff like that, I'd feel a little bit more like maybe I was in the right place. So that would be the distinction archetypally between a jester archetype, who's all about fun and in the moment, don't take things too seriously, and a, say, a sage archetype who's there to give truth and wisdom to somebody. So that is, um, I think that is, that, that, that's worthy of, of, of note. I, I wonder, Lucas, though, is it, should we quickly outline the 12 archetypes or at least the ones that the yes. popular 12? Is that be helpful? Perfect. Or... Be perfect to name. Yes, sure. Just to give folks a flavor. Are you okay right. with that, Paul? Yeah, so, so uh, let, let me start with the, the basic division. Because uh, when we are doing a, a archetype analysis, um, we always ask, me, uh, but let, let me first just uh, catch up with what you said uh, before, because there, there is a catch in, in, in what you said. Uh, because, uh, well, yeah, this is true. Uh, if I was looking for a financial manager, uh, but if I was to stand out on the market, uh, there's this differentiate or, or die approach. Uh, and if you are running a financial institutions and all the financial institutions are using the archetypes of a sage, are using the archetypes connected to wisdom and so on and so on, you can easily stand out uh, on the market by using a different archetype because uh, there's a, a, another way of understanding archetypes. Uh, when I was talking about the brand, uh, I was uh, telling you that, that there are two layers. So, so one, there's the utilitarian layer. Uh, it's what you do, basically. How can you help your customers? Uh, but the, the other two layers, according to, I don't know, Simon Sinek's, uh, for example, is, is how and why. 
And this is where the arch archetypes come into play. So I am a financial institution. Uh, my what remains un unchanged, uh, but my how changes uh, when I switch the archetype. I, I can use a gesture. Uh, we have a bank in Poland uh, that is using a gesture archetype, that has been using a gesture archetype for, for, for quite a long uh, while. And they were the one addressing the younger market. The, the, they were the first one to, to get online services and, and so on and so on. Uh, but they stand in the direct opposition to the banks uh, that were using the sage, the marble arches, and and stuff like that. So, so uh, yeah, I, I love that. Uh, Do you mind if I'm coming in just very quickly? And just yeah, say, sure. Absolutely, hundred percent agree. And and I've used that same tactic in my work. You know, if you are looking to differentiate, do an analysis of your marketplace, find out what the typical archetypes are that show up, and then ask yourself whether you want to be the same. Because as you say, Paul, like. No one wants to be the same. You've got yeah, to stand you can out. Do things differently, right? right? So, so, yeah. yeah. So you can use archetypes as a framework, as a tool to to change what you're doing and to show up differently. Assuming, of course, the customer sees value in that, and and it doesn't jar too heavily That's with true. them. Mm -hmm. So you know, just a yeah, because what, yeah. what you said, if I am if I am looking for a certain qualities in my fina financial manager. Uh, the jokey one will not get the job uh, because the, the brand is fulfilling the expectations of the customer. So yeah, definitely. All right. So you've already answered the question: What do we need to know to choose an <laughs> archetype, or how to discover our archetypical? Um, I mean, uh, no, not exactly. Sorry. Because what, what you need okay. to know, you need to ask yourself. This is, I, I think, it's directly from from the hero and the alpha book. You, you need to ask yourself uh, two questions. Uh, when you are choosing the, the archetypes, because there are there's like 12 of them, uh, and when they define your how, uh, you can do your services uh, in any of the way of, of the 12 ways. Uh, so uh, in order to, I don't know, uh, narrow down your, your choice, uh, you have to ask yourself two questions. Uh, first question is whether you are doing the things you are doing uh, the way everybody is doing it, so if you are opening another, uh, I don't know, it, it, Italian restaurant in town, uh, another language school, uh, this is actually the, uh, the, the way everybody is doing it. Uh, or you are doing some, something nobody else has done. So, so you started the first Segway corporation, you started the first, uh, I don't know, uh, bed sharing company, stuff like that. So, so you know, the chaos and the order. Uh, so, so these are the, the two first halves. And the other question you, you need to ask yourself uh, is uh, whether you are focusing on yourself uh, or uh, you are focusing on the outer world, uh, the outer environment. So because uh, let, let me give you an example. Uh, in a car industry, when we are positioning cars, uh, there are cars you are buying for you know, yourself uh, to drive, basically, to, to fulfill the basic utilitarian need. And there are cars you buy to show off. And they're basically, you know, the cars that buy for yourself and the cars you buy for the others to, to see and so on and so on. In, in, within the Volkswagen uh, concern, uh, there's a Volkswagen or Skoda, uh, utilitarian brands mostly, and there's Porsche and this Audi uh, that are meant to be shown off. That, that's what I would say. So, so th there's a, in the price of a Porsche, uh, there's huge amount of uh, of the price uh, is for you know the ability to show off that you don't have in for example Skoda. So then you have uh, chosen your your quarter because there are two halves. Uh, so so you, you have chosen your quarter and then you can go about and and choose archetypes from the quarter and then you have to choose from th three to four and not from twelve. And this is this is much easier. All right. Yeah, as I say, it's to do with customer motivation, isn't it? Mm -hmm. So if you can understand what you know, what part of the market you're serving, as you've said, like your category, but then inside the category, you know, what is driving you know your customers as opposed to driving everybody else? Ideally, you want to show up as as the best choice for them because you're going to give them an experience that they can't get anywhere else. You're going to build an archetypal experience around you know something really exciting for them. And as you say, there's different. There's different motivations and, and usually different archetypes show up for those different motivations. So it's helpful to know what, what they are. Um, I just wonder before we do that, whether we should uh, outline for folks the, the high level archetypes. Do you want me to do that or Paul, do you want to do it? 
No, no, go ahead. I'll just whiz through them, okay, real quick. So we've got the caregiver who looks after people um, and is kind of there to, to help them. Um, we've got the citizen who sits in and is like the everyday, everyday person, sometimes called the everyday guy or the everyday girl. They're there to be the voice of reason and reality um, as part of the community. Uh, we've got the creator, all about obviously crafting things for the future, um, innovation and, um, and, and, and creativity. We have the explorer, who's all about finding new destinations, and they're always off over a mountain somewhere, kind of taking us to new experiences. We have the hero, who um, is probably the most classic of all archetypes. The hero's there to improve the world and save it from some sort of evil through courageous action. And, and then to got show the, off. And to show off. And uh, we've got the innocent, and the innocent is all about um, faith and optimism. Uh, and all they want to do is, is kind of be happy. And so we love, we love the innocent because they give us hope. Uh, we've got the jester, who we've mentioned, all about fun and living in the moment and enjoyment and, uh, you know, not taking things too seriously. We have the lover, who's all about um, sharing deep relationships with somebody. Um, and, uh, and so there's that real kind of like core, deep connection that, that the lover evokes. We have the magician, who's about transformation and change and, and powerfully kind of being a catalyst for a new vision. We have the rebel, who's about all about shaking their fist at something and, and aggressively um, trying to overturn something that's not working. We have the sage, uh, that we've mentioned. So they're all, all about discovering truth. They're the gatekeepers of knowledge and wisdom. And then um, finally, we have the ruler. And the ruler is all about control out of chaos and leading a successful uh, successful community. So they're the, they're the typical 12, as you say, Paul. But there are there are even like some people have taken them even further. I think I've got a I've got this book over here. One second. Um, this one here, which is um, by uh, have you, have you seen this one, Paul? This one's by um, uh, Margaret Hartwell and Joshua C. Chen. And what they do no, is they take that one. Oh, that, well, they take each archetype and they develop four ar archetypes inside them. So, for example, um, let me just take uh, a random so make, That makes them 48, right? 48 yeah. different archetypes? Oh, okay. Yeah, okay. So, so we've got the caregiver and they've got like four, the angel, the guardian, the healer, and the Samaritan, and they have different right. differentiations between that. I find that really complicated. I mean, so That's the true. way that their model works is they say select an archetype mm -hmm. out of 12, and then they, they say, look, there's four versions of this. I find that really, really complicated. I think that that confuses That's teams. True. Heavily. Yeah, the, the, the way I do it, uh, I, I say that there are layers within the archetype. So, so uh, you can take, for example, the innocent, and then there are a couple of ways of doing innocent. Uh, Definitely. And, uh, but uh, from, from my perspective, I would like uh, also to, to tell you that there are practical um, implications of, of using archetype in a brand communication. Because, for, because for example, uh, let, let's take this innocent. Uh, there are some phrases, some catchphrases uh, that uh, each archetype is using. And no matter what you are producing, no matter what you are selling, uh, if you are using these catchphrases, people will connect you more uh, to the archetype that, that you are. So, so, for example, innocent lives in the past. So uh, innocent ideal idealizes the past and say, uh, says that, uh, yeah, in, in past, everything was great. And, and mm, her catchphrase is remember when. Remember when your childhood was simple. Uh, remember when uh, the food tasted better. Uh, and uh, the, the innocent will bring back uh, those the good old memories days. Of, of, yeah, good old days, memories of the innocent past. Uh, she, he will bring, the company will bring it to you through the products. And, and uh, if you show it, then you are actually using the archetype in your brand communication. So, so this is how it's done. So, but do we have to choose uh, choose one archetype, or we can be somewhere in the middle, or combine <clears throat> two archetypes? Well, I mean, well, it's funny to say that, Lucas, because like one <laughs> of the things I love to do, right, is with teams, um, particularly leadership teams, is to throw them completely out of their comfort zones, right? So I get the leadership team together, and um, you know, these are people obviously used to. To thinking very um, sort of tactically, usually commercially about their business. They, they they like spreadsheets. They track numbers. That's great. And we say right, that's that's all useful. But let's just put that together to, to one side. Let's do some archetype stuff. Here's the twelve archetypes. And obviously, you know, we'd put a bit more detail into the the way that that, that we present those. 
you know, which which one do you think you are, you know, at the moment? You know, so there's different ways of doing this. And usually what happens is, is I send them away into, you know, they have a think about it and then they come back and I get them to kind of write on a piece of paper which one they are um, and then reveal it. And what happens is you most typically they're all a little bit different. Right now, when that happens, what I say to them is, look, can you not see that we have a, a problem? Right. Because we have a misalignment of an understanding amongst you, the leaders, as to the role we're playing right now. Um, I mean, the other way of doing it is saying, OK, where would we want to move to? So we go from this period of sporadic, uh, almost like personality disorder in the brand. Um, how can we move to now a point where we're all aligned? And that's the that's the, the secret of doing a great archetype workshop is designing the exercises to help them get there so that they can really be really excited and come away having a clear, aligned understanding of the role that they want to begin to play. And that then starts a strategic program of work to help orientate the business towards um, something you know really clear and simple and, and exciting for everybody, including the customer. Um, so that's kind of how, how you do it. But sometimes, Lucas, um, you know, I get this question. Oh, can we be two archetypes? OK, and I, I, I change in my mind on this. I've got to be completely honest because I have examples where that's so not appropriate. Like they just need to lean into one and just be super strong. But other times I think it does add an interesting blend because if you can almost have a, a strong one and then a secondary one. OK, and this is I don't know. Paul might disagree. Some people disagree with that as a an, an, as, as being um, a good idea. I think it's good, but I think you need to have one clear one that you know we are this. But you might supplement that with a little bit of seasoning from another one. So you can say, okay, we are the innocent. Um, and, you know, we do hark back to the past. But we're also the magician, right? Because although we are nostalgic and we, we, we want the past and we, we want faith and optimism, we believe in transformation. And so we believe things can transform back to how they were previously or whatever the narrative is that we want to agree and so we see ourselves as a as an innocent um magician you know and that's how we kind of see ourselves so the, if you add two it gives a huge amount of combinations in the way that teams think and ultimately i believe that um that the power in having archetypes at the table is actually in the alignment it brings afterwards you know, some people say, oh, is this super, this is pseudoscience. This is hocus pocus. This is rubbish. It's like, no, no, no. It's grounded in science. But we're using the principles that we know instinctively relate to all of us. We're using those ultimately to align the team around what we're going to build for the future. And that's how I, that's how I sort of, sort of see it. What do you think, Paul, about blending archetypes? I do not disagree. I mean, I, I get this question a lot, especially at the very, very beginning, because people ask, OK, why do we have to choose one or can we choose more than one because we are, you know, complicated and so on and so on. The, the main answer I give at this very moment is uh, brands are built with consistency. And this is an exercise in consistency. Uh, so what you give up is equally important as what you actually try to present. And uh, I totally agree with, with what you say, Matt. Uh, so, so you should have a primary archetype, which is the result of the exercise in consistency. And then you can add a flavor to it because we as humans are not single-minded. Uh, we present as different persons to different er surroundings around us. Uh, so yeah, you can add flavor uh, and this combination of, of uh, innocent and magician well, super brilliant. I can think of a couple of companies that, that uh, would do that. So, so yeah, definitely this. Yeah. Okay. No, that's, speaking about, that's okay. okay. okay speaking about um, choosing the right um, archetype or adding a flavor to the, the one, the main archetype, um, how to do it in two situations, a uh, new emerging company and then old one, existing one. And is there any difference or how to do it? Okay. You have a new company. Okay. Matt. What Matt well, said, basically, excuse me, that, that okay. I chip in. Uh, sure. what, what Matt said, uh, you have to imagine the place you want to be. Uh, okay. This is exercise you said you were doing uh, with, with the management team. So, so yeah, uh, you can either, you know, map the place you are, or in case of the new company, you can map the place you want to be in because you are nowhere right now. 
Yeah, I think I think the other thing to, to, to think about is if you have an existing company, OK, like a heritage brand. So in the UK, I'm sure in Poland, you have lots of heritage brands, but brands have been around 100 years. You know, you, you, you have to be respectful of that, I think, particularly if instinctively customers are thinking a certain way about that that brand. If you want to change it, you need to be very deliberate and considered in how you do that. Uh, and, and if you're if, if you, you know, you've got to have a good reason to do that, because if you're successful already in one place, don't start chopping and changing and causing chaos, I would say, in the customer's mind. You've got to make it easy for customers to attach the right meaning to you. So you have to be very considered and more thoughtful. I think if there's an existing established business, you need to listen heavily to customers. But even so, in doing that, you can find the archetypal route, what's driving them, what's attracting them to your business. You know, why do you buy from us? over the competition is a great question to ask. Uh, what attracts you to what we're offering? And so, yes, you might want to modernize and improve, but you might not necessarily need to leave behind the archetypal things which uh, people really value about what you're doing. And um, what I would say, though, is um, what with a new company, what and, and old companies, I suppose, one of the things that I find useful is not to just have an archetype, right, um, that we decide on. As, as Paul said, this is about using this concept to help form the strategy of the future. And so what I tend to do is after we've got the archetype, you know, we might we might move on into thinking about, well, a bit more about this question, like how should we show up? So if we are the innocent, what experiential traits should people witness if they come across us? So in other words, if you're an innocent brand, um, that should mean something for the customer. Well, what does that exactly mean? So I like to have these, you know, work on traits, which are kind of like, um, you know, character, um, they're, 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 they're parts of the character of the brand. So the innocent, like Paul said, might hark back to the past. They might be um, hopeful for the future. And so you kind of describe, as it were, the brand as if it's a person. It, it's called anthropomorphize, which is an awful word. Basically means, you know, think of the brand as a, as a person. And once we've got that and we can start communicating that internally, we can use that to help us make great decisions. So, for example, if we mapped out your customer experience and we said, look, you know, here's our traits, our archetypal traits of being hopeful for the future of all these lovely things. And here's your customer experience right now. Do you evoke those feelings? Are our customers actually experiencing those things as they go through, as they're onboarded into your software service or whatever you're doing or onboarded as a customer, as they're, as they're experiencing working with you? Like, are you living into those traits? And if not, that's OK, but that's an opportunity to then to then kind of move the dial and actually start to really create something exciting for for customers to to, to, to work with. And everybody in your company should be like, well, we know that we're the innocent. So we already know instinctively how that should begin to, to look, feel, sound um, as, as the customer goes through. If you've done your job right as a leadership team, it should cascade out uh, from that uh, so that you live your strategy. All this, right. this, is a, this is a matter of actually implementing a, a culture. Yeah. Implementing an archetype uh, involves implementing a, a culture because uh, in, in, in the simplest of terms, uh, the, the archetype in, in, within your brand defines what your brand is thinking, maybe. Uh, but it's up to you, up to the managerial team, up to the, the corporate culture, to uh, scale it down, to cascade it down uh, to what you are actually doing, to actually, uh, actually saying. So, so these are the two levels uh, of, of the, the archetype implementation. And if you have an archetype that is written on a wall in your, I don't know, corporate conference room, and there's nothing uh, in the implementation layer connecting what you are doing, the customer experience that Matt was referring to, um, to, to the archetype, then you have failed. You, you, you have, I don't know, spent money on a workshop uh, and you written it on, on the corporate wall, but, but there's, there's nothing in the, in the experience of the customer uh, that indicates that this archetype has actually been in, implemented. Yeah, yeah. I see this a lot in, in, in a lot of companies, not just with archetypes, but, you know, we ha you have the, the vision, the values and all the good stuff that, that, that we know is important. That there is a massive disconnect between um, strategically thinking about the positioning of the brand and the reality 
of actually making that happen. You know, I come oh, from yes. many, many years ago, like 20 years ago, a creative graphic design background. And one of the reasons I got into strategy was because I was sick of coming across that time and time again. You would veneer the company or the brand and it would look great and maybe it would stand out in the market. Maybe it'd even stand out in an archetypal way, a rebel in the market. And you say, all right, you know, this is great. But then you go back a year later and, you know, customers are leaving because the experience they were expecting because it was presented a certain way was not the reality. And so we've got to be truthful. You know, I, I, I often sort of say to leaders, this is not just kind of like some sort of um, uh, fluffy exercise. You know, this is going to help. This should and it will if you, you know, if you hire me, it will determine the way that we make decisions going forwards. So we need to be super serious about this. Um, one thing perhaps we, we, we haven't mentioned and we should throw in is, and I think we, we touched on it a bit, is doing some good analysis, right, in two areas, I would say. Well, actually three. I'll go through three. So the first piece of analysis you want to do is the marketplace. We mentioned that earlier, right? Map out your competitors in your category. Map out, you know, their core messaging and, you know, how they look, how are they coming across? Are they archetypal? Some people are not. They're really bland. You know, fine. That's a great opportunity. Others are. They're really kind of hammering a particular archetype. Great. Probably something to avoid then, right? So we don't look like them. Um, so that's the first thing, the marketplace. The other thing that you want to, to kind of um, uh, look at is if you've got existing customers or you, potential customers, speak to them. Speak to them about what's motivating them or what might motivate them to purchase from you because you can find the, um, the seeds of, 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 of thought that then help you leverage an archetypal direction forwards. And the final one, which we have already touched on, is the actual leadership team themselves. You know, how do they see themselves and do they see, can they... Can they lean into, uh, uh, you know, a particular archetype? So, for example, like, you know, you've got to bear in mind that in a lot of businesses that the, the leadership team are going to have to stand on a platform at some point in a conference and talk about their company. Now, if you're saying, like, we're a bunch of rebels, you know, the brand is rebel. We're going to be, like, smashing down doors and, and, and you know, we're going to rebel against this evil that's there that we're, that we're going to overcome. And all of the people are not like that. Uh, I, I always kind of get a bit nervous because I'm like, well, you you say that, that you, the brand needs to be this, but you yourselves aren't. So so it's not going to work, is it? Like we need to find something authentic and true to, to, to what you all have done. And if I'm working directly with the CEO, sometimes that means me sort of advising and saying, look, maybe the people that have got us here are not the people to take us there. That's a decision that they have to make. But, you know, you need everybody to be on board. And if, if you are if you are the rebels, like I work with one client. And they were an accountancy firm, okay? And they really lent into the rebel thing. Like, they went crazy. Um, their offices looked like Google. They, they got rid of, uh, they stopped wearing suits and ties. And um, they, they, they were, they're flying at the moment. Huge growth in the Midlands in the UK. Um, and that's because many years ago, they decided, you know, we're going to go in the opposite direction. We're going to be the rebels of accountancy. Um, and they leveraged it to such a degree, like I think their website is like bright pink and green and just everything you wouldn't expect from an accountancy firm. But the reason they've been successful is because they mirrored what their customers really wanted. Their customers were maverick CEOs who wanted to scale and grow their businesses. And they were sick of dusty, boring accountancy firms, which no one really understood. And they would dread going into, you know, every year. And they flipped that to having a great workspace environment. That I think they had a running track going around one of their offices. Um, you know, there was, it's just a vibrant atmosphere. They hired lots of really exciting people, top talent who were, you know, not interested in wearing suits and ties, but super smart when it came to accountancy and presenting, um, you know, to, and speaking the language of CEOs. And yeah, absolute, absolutely worked for them because it, it wasn't just a veneer. It was something that they really lived into and still do to this day. And it became part, as you've said, Paul, of their culture that 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 really worked. So bear that in mind. These are not arbitrary decisions. These are, you know, can really make a massive difference. But you have to lean into it and it has to be truthful. OK, uh, you both already introduced yourself at the very beginning, but I wonder what is what is your archetype, Paul? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so if you can introduce yourself through, through the archetype, if it's one or you added some flavors. Uh, I 
try to be, I, I think I'm considered a sage uh, in, in the market because I'm here very, very long. Uh, but what I'm known for uh, is the, the jester flavor uh, because I know things, uh, but, but I do stand ups on stage. So, you know, uh, these two combine pretty well. Okay, so sage and, with the flavor of the jester. Yeah, I, I, I think that, yeah. Okay, Matt, what's that. yours? Yeah, so it's really interesting. I, I also have a bit of jester in me, but I, I don't I don't think that's the main reason I'm hired or or, or, or kind of considered. I, I like to think that I lean into the magician. And the magician's all about transformation um, and energy and being that catalyst for change. And so often I say to my clients, like, why why have you hired me, you know, out of the out of the thousands out there? You know, why why little Matt with his beard? And they're like, well, because Frankly, Matt, you've got this energy that we really love and we need that. And so, and that's going to help us transform. So I'm the magician, but the way I do it is a little bit with Jester. So interesting, Paul, that we've got that. But you know what, Lucas, what I think is really interesting is about that question is that we, is, is that it shows that archetypes, they can be leveraged on a, in, a, in, in a number of different ways. Yes, you've got big businesses that can align and rally their teams using the simple ideas of archetypes because everybody instinctively understands them and once you say look we're going to show up in the customer story as the explorer we're going to help them find a new destination like everybody just kind of already understands what that means it doesn't take a lot of explanation and so from top to bottom in an organization they can they can get to grips with it so that's one thing um, and then you can make you know, decisions to go out to the customer with that but then you can also use them as you've just done as uh, personal branding tools so every single person, you know, I think should be thinking about managing the meaning professionally that people attach to them. And so this is a case of, of showing up in a particular way consistently so that people know and trust what you're all about. And so, you know, I think that's that's something that's super interesting. And, you know, if, if you've been listening to this and you think, oh, you know, I, I, I think from a business perspective, apply it to yourself as well. Think through how you need to show up to, to make a success of your vision. But you need to remember that the way you are thinking about yourself uh, is different from what usually people think about you. So, so, so this alignment Matt was, was talking about uh, also means doing, doing this exercise. So, so you have to ask people and uh, you have to confront with what you are thinking about yourself and then come up with the answer that's, I don't know, around the middle somewhere. Mm -hmm. I would, okay. I would love people to be thinking about me as a, I don't know, rebel, uh, but I'm no rebel. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but I wonder if, if not archetypes, then what? Are there any alternatives? Uh, to what? To archetypes. But to so, do yeah, what? So, maybe this is the question. Yes, to do to what? Find a way how to how to show up on on the market. I'm yeah, just, I, 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 to use I, archetypes. I, Are there any other tools? I can yeah. use I, instead of archetypes, for example. Before I came across archetypes, and you still see, uh, you know, agencies doing this as well, a, a lot. Um, they will say, um, if you were a, if your brand was a character in a film, who would it be? Like, that's just a, you know, classic. So, yeah, one. the dispersonification, anthropo anthropomorphization that, that Matt was yeah. talking so, about. You know, uh, there's loads of techniques where you can do that. The issue with that is, okay, firstly, that's not really grounded in science. Secondly. If you get a new employee and they've never watched that film before or they've never read that book before, like they will find it difficult to understand or connect. Thirdly, archetypes are so deep, right? It's like then then none of the archetypes are offensive to anybody, right? For example, like, you know, the at least the 12 that we tend to use, they're all very positive. Um, and you can you can sort of they're, they're sort of they're not like solid, like the, the edges are a little bit sort of fluffy so you can kind of move in and around that territory and and you can play with different aspects of it whereas if you say well i'm uh, i don't know i'm brad pitt and fight club right that's who we are like i just i just find that quite rigid and really like um you know aggressively kind of um you know sets the rules and then and then you can't move outside of that so whereas archetypally what it might mean to be an explorer can be you can be an explorer in the software product that you're using or in your customer experience or in your retail store, you can play with that archetypally and, the, and there's a depth of the experiences that you can create. Um, so that is one technique that I've seen used that's an alternative 
to to archetypes. But as I say, I think archetypes they have that they have the edge on them because they're so they're so instinctively uh, powerful. We used archetypes as an entry point uh, when doing brand related work, and there are two ways we can go from this entry point. Uh, one is uh, a tool that we use, and it's called uh, culture creation matrix. Uh, it's the three layers. So, so the, the first layer is, is the deeds, what we do. Uh, the second layer is habits, what, what we, I don't know, have habits of doing. And the third layer is, is uh, vision or, or what we have in the back of our, our heads. And within the, the, the matrix, uh, on each layer, the, there, there's like three tools. On, on the deeds uh, layer, there's uh, punishments, there re there's rewards, and there's knowledge. So, so when we are implementing a culture shift to the company, we say to the owners or the managers, uh, okay, what are the actions, the deeds um, that your people will be most definitely punished for and they know it? Uh, and what are the deeds that they will be punished for that they wouldn't be punished for in any other company? This is what, what uh, makes your culture stand, stand apart. Uh, so, so there are nine tools all together in, in the culture creation matrix. So, so this is one of the tools we use. The second tool we use is, is called Brand Skeleton. This is by, uh, by, by David Acker. Uh, brand Skeleton consists of the brand story. So th this is where the archetypes are, are the way of going into. Um, then there, there's brand words, there, there's motto, there's say brand icons. So, so Matt is coming from, from the graphic design, me too, actually. So, so yeah, uh, we both <laughs> advanced to, 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 to brand strategy. Um, so, so brand icons uh, and brand rituals. And brand rituals are the closest things to, to, to brand archetypes. So, so we position the brands using rituals. Uh, there's a the research by BBDO agency uh, about how consumers place the, the, the products along the way they are thinking. For example, if they mm, want to do something that is uncommon, uh, this, this is called preparation for the battle. Uh, and this is kind of an archetype, but, but connected to a certain, I don't know, a certain activity that, that you have to uh, do. And uh, yeah, we use uh, positioning through, through, um, through that uh, as well. So, so not the only kid in town, uh, but uh, useful, definitely, what Matt said, useful. Okay. Um, I wonder, are you able, knowing the name of the brand, to assign it to the archetype? I mean you, both. You mean, uh, uh, but the, the name that is present on the market? Yes. So uh, can we do a little quiz? Can we do a little quiz? Uh, this is a funny, funny part of this, yeah, uh, sure. of this conversation. <laughs> Um, but I wonder if you have, a, this, is, this is also always the problem at the university I teach. Uh, do you have a sheet of paper and a pen in front of you? Uh, no, yes, I have an iPad. A, will it do? <laughs> <laughs> okay, no, no, you can use an iPad. Um, so I will give you a brand and uh, you will write, you write the archetype. Uh, so if there are any differences, we can, we can talk about them. Just so let me grab my iPad. All right. All right. I didn't know there was oh, going to Now I know you are account. now I know you are you're standing Paul, not sitting. <laughs> yeah, I have a standing desk. It, it does wonders for the expression when when recording or you know consulting with the customers. Okay, so 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 the first the first uh, brand name is Ben and Jerry. And if you can show the archetype wrote down. <laughs> well, you want me to you want what do you want me to do? Yeah, to show it. Show it so, no, show it. Show, oh, show, okay. show, let, me, let me let me put it on something a bit better. I've just got it on a scrap of paper here. <laughs> uh, okay, outlaw. Okay. I was going to go jester. Okay, right. so outland jester. So, um, the reason for jester is is that um, I mean, at least here in the UK, they really don't take themselves that seriously, right? So, ad advertising wise, they are. They are all over the place, but I can definitely see Rebel in there because they are very different to anybody else. Um, I just remember one advert they've got. It says um, ingredients, big dollar, big dollop of this, big dollop of that, Ben mm -hmm. and Jerry's. 
So it's it's like not that serious at all. Um, and they use cartoons a lot, which is always a good kind of uh, entertainment thing. And I also think instinctively, Ben and Jerry's, uh, at least in the UK here, people buy it when they're at the cinema or when they're about to watch a film and they're in that mode of entertainment. So it's kind of like a fun, uh, you know, in the moment, jestery style brand that, that, that people connect with. So that's why I was going to go with that. Okay, so I was thinking about the US Ben and Jerry's. So, so th this is the, the context that we need to have uh, because there, there are probably two different brands with two different archetypes and two different markets. Uh, ben and Jerry's in, in the US, uh, well, they, they pride themselves, uh, pride themselves uh, by going after an idea uh, that is not very popular sometimes. Uh, and uh, they do much of their advertising through, I don't know, scandals, but not scandals that they uh, devised themselves, but scandals uh, by other people who just, you know, oppose the idea. So, so uh, yeah, I would go with... with so, with, so we with can have a slightly different archetypes or slightly different flavors, flavors depending on the market. Of course, we can have completely okay. different brand. Uh, if, if the market is different, if the uh, yeah. target group is different, if the driver is different, so, so the message is, is, is different, uh, yeah, you, you, you can, oh, wait. That was good. That was good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, so the next, the next friend no, is... No, no, yours won't do it. it. It's a new Mac OS system. So, so it's in developer beta. So, sorry. <laughs> okay. Kinder Bueno. Um, oh, this is easy. I know. I'm not that familiar. I'm not familiar with that. That's the um, that's the chocolates for um, Kinder okay. Bueno. That's the. Is it white little? Let me just check this out. Uh -huh. okay, they have this very sensu sensual uh, advertising, sensual and sexual, uh, which are two basic traits of the of the lover archetype. So sorry, no questions there. Yeah, okay. I. I'd, I'd go with that. I'm just looking at, I'm not massively familiar with them. I try and stay off the chocolate, you know? <laughs> not, not okay, so so maybe you have um, in your um, apartment... You have to spice. remember that, that in, in your lover archetype, chasing the rabbit okay. is more important than actually catching the rabbit. So, so, so what they are showing is the okay. promise. Uh, yeah. Exactly the same as in Magnum ice cream. Uh, yeah. You show the pleasure, like you show the pleasure with sexual context, sexual connotations, uh, but it's just a chocolate or it's just an ice cream, right? And, and, I, and I think the other thing to say there is about, you know, as I mentioned before, the, the lover is about deep um, relationship. So often what you find is lots of up close shots of the detail of the product, whatever it might be, if it's the chocolate, it's all about the crunch, there's a beautiful sound. Yeah, the so, yeah, sensual the experience. Sensual connection, yeah, that gives uh -huh. that depth. Um, so yeah, I could I could definitely see that. Sorry, what was the next one, uh, Lucas? Old, old Spice. Old Spice. Oh. Well, Tricky one. <laughs> okay. I, think, I think historically that would have very much yeah, been. A... That, that was I was going to say. I remember the old oh, it's Old Spice, but right now yeah. it's the Jester. I agree. It is the Jester. I think in the ancient times, you know, the the logo is like a little ship. When we were young. Um, we were young. I think it was more, probably more of like an explorer brand. It like reminded yeah. you of like um, old merchant ships and, you know, having some yeah. nice spices come back from, from somewhere exotic. They completely changed it now. So they flipped it. I mean, it was dying, right? No one cared uh -huh. about it. Everyone thought it was awful. Um, a, a granddad brand, if you like. Um, yeah. So, but, yeah. but now they've completely changed it with all the new uh, positioning, the new advertising. It's much more entertainment focused. And so that too, I would agree, is, is, a, is their new strategic uh, direction is, is, is Jester. And all right. One, yeah. Okay, so two more. Uh, Vans, so the clothes and the shoes for the skaters. Vans? No idea. I, I don't know the brand, so, so no idea. Nothing? Yeah, well, I would, I would go Rebel, like, because, I mean, they're, they're, they're kind of, um, their, their tagline is off the wall. Um, and so they're very much around kind of like, um, that underground skater community who is not mainstream. So I think they built their whole brand around not being mainstream of shaking their fist, if you like, at, uh, at, at, you know, kind of normal hobbies, normal world, um, normal use of streets. Um, and what they're doing is they're flipping that and they're, they're, they're kind of, they, they position themselves as that rebel. So I would go rebel. All right. Okay. And the last one, Gucci. 
I'd go lover with that one myself again. I, I'd yeah. say ruler. Oh, yes. Maybe that's a good shout. Yeah. Because they are about control, aren't they? They are about control. Like, being and about they control. are the place to go when we are talking about the high fashion brands. So, so yeah, I'd say the ruler. Yeah, no, I could go with that. I could go with that. That's fair. That's fair enough. So it's either ruler or, or, or lover, depending on um, and everything. But you are, I think you are quite right there because when I think about a lot of their advertising, if you are talking lover, I, I'd go with Armani. Okay, yeah, Armani is more yeah. of a lover than, than than Gucci. Fair play. Let's go. Let's let's go. Let's go with your one then on that one. <laughs> but Lucas, what I think this shows right is it's interesting because we're on the outside looking in at some of these brands, okay, and we are guessing as consumers as to what their sort of approach is. The reality is, is that some of the teams running those brands may not even realize archetypally what they're doing. They may not be applying an archetypal strategy. They may have stumbled into it and they, they know that that's how their brand needs to appear, but they, they may not have done. Um, and that goes back to my point at the start, which is that the power and the value of plugging in archetypes into your strategic thinking is the alignment it should bring you internally. Right. And if then that comes out externally, you've done your job. In other words, if somebody says, oh, that was a really sensual experience and you've, you know, two years before sat in a room and thought we're the lover, you know that your strategy is working because your customers are feeding back the, the right information about what you've designed to go forward. But a lot of companies don't do that. A lot of businesses don't do that. They're misaligned. They're sporadic. They have split personality disorder. So if I'm talking to the sales team, I'm getting a ex different experience to the HR team and a different experience to the, the customer success team. What we need is joined up thinking, brand building that is powerful and archetypes can really help you get that alignment that you need to get there. All right, Paul, anything to add? Nothing to add, really. Uh, no, <laughs> no, no. What Matt said, uh, archetypes, are, yeah, archetypes are a great starting point uh, yes. for building the strategy. They are very high strategic tool, and if they don't trickle down uh, to the lower levels of, of the tactics of, of everyday operations, uh, they're useless. Uh, you can have them and not use them, uh, but on the other hand, you can have a great execution and what Matt said, not know about the archetype because you, this is just one of the tools uh, that you are using to, to, to create a brand strategy. So, so yeah. <clears throat> okay. So that's wonderful final statement. Okay. Matt, Paul, thank you so much for your time and for sharing your knowledge, or maybe I should say wisdom with the students, entrepreneurs and marketers, not only in Poland. And thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for having us. It's been good fun. I, Paul, I've enjoyed it. It's been good. Let's do it again sometime. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I'll catch you. When I'm, okay. I'm, where, where are you located? Uh, UK. UK, Wales. Uh, yeah, I know UK, but but, but I, I can hear UK. But Yeah, I'm in the middle of Wales, uh, which is um, uh, you know part of the United Kingdom, but it's on the west side. All right. I'll find you. <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you. See ya.